And sort of what we do is we work with ultra high net worth families globally in building what I like to call asset holding structures. And what does that actually mean in plain English? It's harder and harder for families to, to hold their assets and still get privacy, still get some asset protection, still get some legal tax optimization, still do some next generation estate planning, have a cash component. And that's sort of where we come in. Moving on to our next segment, which is two Twitter threads that we want our users to know about. The first one is from Mudit Gupta, the merge checklist for Ethereum users. And his follow-up tweet to that was nothing. The checklist had nothing. Probably the biggest on-chain event in the history of crypto is about to happen. Essentially, BlackRock, one of the uh, largest asset managers in the world, will use CF Benchmark's Bitcoin index for its new crypto offering. The, to the launch of BlackRock Bitcoin Fund is a sign of how far crypto has matured as an asset class. The compound ETH market that was frozen and the governance time lock, whether it's a hindrance or necessary. So the governance process for urgent matter like this one or others, like pausing market due to extreme volatility for a token, are something that could benefit from a dedicated multisig, which could enact changes faster. So Roger, okay. thanks for joining me today. Uh, my first question to you is, I want to know how 1291 Group is helping uh, the crypto. But first, I want to know what 1291 Group is about and how you are helping the traditional space. Great. Fantastic. Thanks for having me today. Um, lo yeah, I'd love to tell you a bit about 1291, tell you a bit about, our, my, about myself, um, and yeah, we can just try dive into it. So 1291, what do the numbers mean? It's the founding year of Switzerland. So we're based in Zurich, uh, 12 offices around the world, Zurich, Geneva, Liechtenstein, London, Panama, Bogota, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Dubai, Hong Kong. I'm the CEO of the Singapore office. And sort of what we do is we work with ultra high net worth families globally, in building what I like to call asset holding structures. And what does that actually mean in plain English? So historically, if you're a wealthy family, you held all your assets in a BVI or a Cayman Island company or a Singapore company or a trust. But now because of FACTA, because of CRS, because of the Pandora Papers and the OECD cracking down on these different things, it's harder and harder for families to, to hold their assets and still get privacy, still get some asset protection, still get some legal tax optimization, They'll do some next generation estate planning, have a cash component, and that's sort of where we come in. So we sort of build the next generation of a offshore company or a trust, if you'd like. Um, and that's your that's your patek, right? You what you just said is P A T E C. Correct, and we always use a very simple framework, as you correctly point out, patek, to sort of remember the benefits of what we do. So P for privacy, A for asset protection, T for tax, E for estate planning, C for cash. Um, and it's usually one of the, a component of one of those five things that we're helping families with, right? Um, if it's families from, uh, let's say, a, a developed country, a US, UK, Australia, Western Europe, it's usually about tax and tax optimization in a legal fashion. If it's about developing countries, it, um, let's say it's uh, from, from Asia, from Latin America, from Middle East, it's more about privacy and asset protection where these things are, are oftentimes key. Um, and, and tax maybe a distant second. Um, so that's sort of what we do and, and sort of how we help. Uh, we have clients from all over the world. I have clients from over 45 different countries. Um, we have, we have, and, and we have, we're licensed uh, globally as well. So, so, you know, it's quite a unique sort of solution and, and, and toolbox that we do have. Um, but what we, yeah, what we so, sort of saw was, you know, I think a lot of the, the historical, um, you know, families, you know, a lot, a lot, yeah, historically a lot of families around the world they wanted to keep their assets, you know, sort of private, sort of asset protected. And that's sort of where we sort of came in. I'd say right now, you know, from our business, 60% of our business really go towards the private banks. I sell to the major private banks and they oftentimes resell to their clients. Um, we also do a lot of work with the big four accounting firms. Um, and we also do a lot of work with uh, the, 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 the big law firms of the world. So the Baker McKinsey's and the Withers of the world, um, teaching them how to use these structures and then having them propose these structures for their clients. And the last little book is that we, we do get some work from the trust companies as well, just because trusts under, you know, around the world are sort of all under attack. And so oftentimes they do need a, an additional structure underneath the trust to bring back the privacy, bring back the asset protection and that sort of, and bring back the tax optimization. And sort of that's what we come in. 
Um, it's important to note that out of our firm, out of 35 partners globally, 22 are tax lawyers. That's where we really come from. Um, the chairman, the vice chairman, um, head of Asia, all Swiss tax lawyers. We have wealth planners from some of the major banks. So we have wealth planners from Julius Baer, Deutsche Bank, UBS, uh, Citibank. And there's a very big bank in Singapore called DBS. And two years ago, the global head of DBS, wealth planning, left DBS to join us. Um, we have a lot of in insurance expertise. The ex-head of Generali for Pan Europe runs our London office. The ex-head of Swiss Life, Quilter, um, Sun Life for North Asia and the Hong Kong offices. We have some ex-trustees. Myself, I spent 20 years with different family offices around the world. So we were using the structures for our families. Um, and, and these structures, I think, you know, I think for, for, for your context, you know, for people, I think coming from, let's say, a U.S., a Canada, you know, these structures will provide uh, tax optimization. Um, basically, it's tax deferral. Once you're in the structure, you can trade your different assets. You can trade the crypto um, and it's all being tax deferred. Which means okay. That yeah. I so that them. I was so even if that so what what is this structure first of all? Let's let's talk about what this structure is. Sure. Um. You know, I think the favorite structure for for people in the U.S. and Canada, we actually use like to use a, a derivative of a life insurance policy. It's called private placement life insurance. Um. Private placement because the uh, investments are private placement, but life insurance because the underlying vehicle is a life insurance vehicle. So we put everything into these different structures. It looks like a life insurance policy because tree is life insurance policy. And because of that, life insurance often oftentimes has you know tax advantages to it. Um and okay, you know, so it's a PP, PPLI. That's the, the private placement life insurance. Correct. Exactly. So a high net worth individual puts their assets, be it traditional real estate uh stocks, or it could be crypto now. And, Correct. and then what happens? So once it's inside, once it's in, in, in this structure, all the trades that you do are all legally what they call tax deferred. You can accrue the taxes. I buy an asset for 50, I sell for 100, usually there's $50 of gains. Usually you might have to pay $25 of taxes. So $75 comes back to me, I read that $75. Underneath our structure, the full $100 comes back. So I can compound my gains much, much, much faster. So you know, I, I think that that's quite advantageous. Um, you know, there's also other benefits to it in terms of reporting requirements. Um, you know, for reporting requirements, oftentimes, you know, governments around the world are asking to, to itemize your trades now. And that obviously, if you trade a lot, that could be, you know, um, quite a headache at the end of the year. In, in this structure, you don't have to itemize your trades anymore. It's single line reporting. At the end of every year, you just report back that you hold a life insurance policy with a cash surrender value, 50 bucks, and that's all you report. It's single line reporting all consolidated you know it's all it's, it's very very efficient um these structures i think you know generally our our, our um our clients we really start about the the five million mark um that being said you know i think we have some clients that may be as small as one to two million but the i guess the overall fees may be higher on a percentage basis right so usually we're we're charging under one percent but if it's on a smaller on a smaller book it may be you know higher in terms of the, the fees um but that being said, you know, if you have if you're early stage in some crypto investments and you do think it's going to go 100 X, it, it may it may make sense to put these structures sooner rather than later. And the one other caveat is once, you know, putting it into the structure is a taxable event. But once it's in the structure, it's all tax deferred. So, you know, it, it makes sense to put these things in as, as early as possible. Um, you know, for different countries like the U.S., for Canada, there's different rules we have to pay attention to if you're in the U.S. or, or or Canada, you, you do need a licensed advisor in between you and your investments. Uh, but there's lots of digital asset managers who can help you uh, help you manage that assets that, that can, can 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 give you that sort of um, that that advice. Um, and you do also need a diversified portfolio of at least five different investments. But beyond that, I think the nitty gritty we can we can sort of dive into it. Um, but I think more importantly is that you know what we do did notice is about uh, a year and a half, two years ago, was that a lot of the original investors in crypto. You know, they they like, you know, they wanted privacy. They want asset protection, right? That's the original reason why they went to crypto, right? They, you know, they didn't, you know, maybe didn't fully trust currencies. They didn't fully trust governments. And so, you know, we took a look at our structures and we said, hey, look, this is actually quite, could be quite interesting for them, right? Um, and, you know, we had a lot of early clients, you know, early days, you know, they have maybe, maybe they had their coins, let's say with Binance. And Binance, let's say five years ago, was very famously saying, we're not really anywhere, right? Um, and, you know, regulations don't really apply to us. 
you look at Binance today and Binance is, is hiring regulators, right? They're running towards the regulators saying, please regulate me. So it's a very different environment. So all we're doing is we're just taking those initial needs of a, the crypto investors, the privacy and the asset protection, and we're just giving it back, you know, to the original, um, to, to the crypto investors. Um, okay. And so, yeah, so that's been, it's been, been proven to be quite popular. Uh, I'd say, uh, you know, right now, only 5% of my, my business is probably crypto, 95% still traditional families and family offices uh, who are, you know, seeking different structures to hold their assets. Okay, makes sense. So speaking of needs for crypto holders, one of the biggest needs uh, these days is uh, ownership of the assets, right? Mm -hmm. Not your keys, not your coins is, is just floating around everywhere. So what happens when someone puts their assets in this uh, structure? Do they still have the ownership or have they, uh, have they already renounced their ownership? Can they trade the assets? Can they put it in yield generating uh, uh, protocols? How does that work? So it's a, it's a very, very good question. So legally what we're doing is we're actually taking your assets, we're transferring it from yourself um, to the life insurance co company. So legally on paper, uh, the UBO, the ultimate beneficial owner, is actually the life insurance company. They now legally own the assets. What they do give you back is a life insurance policy. Inside life insurance policy are your assets. And, it, and in terms of control, it depends on the jurisdictions. So if you're US, you're Canada, you do need a license manager to, to manage those investments on your behalf. You appoint a license manager. The license manager has to run those assets for you. If you're in other countries, uh, more developing countries, you know you can have a, a limited power of attorney back to you. And, and, and there's, you know, oftentimes you have some control over the different assets. It just depends on jurisdictions. Um, obviously, life insurance is very juris jurisdictional specific. And that's why, you know, we have, you know, 22 lawyers on our on our team, because we can go through different insurance law, different tax law to make sure these things are legally compliant. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, the way that you, you do it. That, that being said, you know, there are lots of licensed managers out there who do do digital assets. Um, once it's in the structures, you can deploy any way you want to. You can put it into DeFi, you can trade it, you can do, you can make early stage token investments. It's a lot of, there's a lot of flexibility in what you can invest in in, in the crypto space. Okay. And then custody wise, do you use a, a, a custodian on the back end? Are you using a specific custodian like Fireblocks or where are the assets, where are the assets stored? Yeah, so I think it's it's quite open, and it really depends on the asset manager that's helping to run the portfolio, and also the client as well. So um, it's you know traditionally it's whatever they're, they've been comfortable with. So if they've been using a fire block, they've been using a centralized exchange, what may be that all stays the same. Okay, um, you know the, as a life insurance company, they don't really manage that part of it. It's up to you, to your responsibility to to figure out what the best custodian is for you, um, and that's sort of the way they where they, they just sort of do it. Um, they just provide sort of the the structure for you to be able to put your assets into the in you know to be able to put your assets into into them and that's it. Got it. Where can people find you? Who should be your who is your ideal client? Who can find you? Yeah, so I think you know most of our clients are you know net worth let's say between five million to two hundred million dollars. Um, you know we have twelve offices as I mentioned around the world. Um, you can always reach me at our our website is twelve ninety one group dot com. Um, my email address is chi, my last name, um, at 1291group.com. Um, CoinChange, you know, is a, is a partner of ours. You can also reach out to the CoinChange folks and they can redirect you towards us. Um, but yeah, so I think for any any referrals from CoinChange, what we do offer is we can do a, a quick half hour, uh, no fee introduction. Um, and we can see if, you know, our structure may be fit for you and depending on what you're, what you're doing. Um, and we can have a, just a, an, inf an informational conversation, you know, and we can just just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what we do and, and if it may fit, you know, we're, we're happy to help or happy to point to the right offices um, that, that may be able to help. Fantastic. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that that's pretty, you know, and, and I think for, as I mentioned, the, these structures are good for not just crypto investors, but traditional investors as well. And it, and it sort of gives you the flexibility to go from crypto to, let's say, your traditional stock and bond portfolio to fixed income to real estate and all the way back, right? All within a tax deferred structure. Um, and so I think it's, it could be quite advantageous from a capital gains perspective. It could be quite, it, it, you know, um, advantageous from an income tax perspective. 
So lots of different things that we can definitely help with. And obviously we can definitely help on the privacy and asset protection as well. And to re-give, to, to sort of re help the crypto investors regain that privacy and asset protection, um, which is I think, you know, increasingly important. And also a, another part of our business is, you know, doing next generation planning. There's always questions about, you know, in the crypto space, okay, I've, I've, I've made, you know, this, this nice nest egg. How do I now give it to the next generation efficiently? So we have different structures that we can talk you through of how you efficiently can do that. Sometimes it's combined with other structures, but, you know, we can lead you through that. Okay, great. Well, uh, I don't think we have uh, enough time to cover everything that you guys offer. You guys offer a lot. And if anyone is interested who's listening to this, uh, definitely reach out to us or reach out to Tom91. Uh, Roger, thanks uh, for joining us. And speaking of partnership, I want everyone to know that we are releasing our research report on institutional asset of choice and adoption on September 29th. Uh, and it's a collaboration between 1291 and us. And they are describing the digital uh, wealth management solutions for high net worth individuals. So do check out the report once it's out. Roger, thanks for joining us today. Great, fantastic. Thanks so much for the time and thanks for having me. Moving on to our next segment, which is two Twitter threads that we want our users to know about. The first one is from Mudit Gupta, who is the uh, information security officer of Polygon. And he tweeted, the merge checklist for Ethereum users. And his follow-up tweet to that was, nothing. The checklist had nothing. Basically, you don't need to do anything. As a user, nothing is changing for you unless you run a node. Then you need to update your nodes. For users, it's the same fees, same tooling, same everything. Right? So by now, everyone knows the biggest, probably the biggest on-chain event in the history of crypto is about to happen. This video is being filmed on September 8th. And by the time this is released, we might have the merge already happened or might not. So it's scheduled around September 10th to 12th. Some people say 13th to 15th. We'll see. However, what's important is there's uncertainty on whether some members of the community would continue to use the proof of work hard fork. So, and then uh, what's, what's CoinChange's stance on that? So uh, CoinChange will support the proof of stake chain as a majority of the protocols and the stakeholders will operate over there, multiple centralized exchange, stablecoin issuers, and DeFi protocols have signaled their full support for the merge, while also attesting that a proof of work half work would not change their decision. And so the merge has been delayed several times in the past, as it is critical to get everything right, since as of now, there is more than tens of billions worth of dollar on chain. So like Moody said, DeFi users do not have to do anything, but the node operators need to upgrade their software to support the merge. And in this regard, CoinChange is following the merge progress and has positioned itself to update the infrastructure accordingly. So that's for the tw Twitter thread number one. Twitter thread number two is pertaining to BlackRock continued interest and development in the crypto space. So what's it, what it about? Essentially, BlackRock, one of the uh, largest asset managers in the world, will use CF Benchmark's Bitcoin index for its new crypto offering. CF Benchmark is a member of the PayWatt group of companies, which is the owner and the operator of centralized exchange Kraken. This agreement has been in the work since 2021, according to CF Benchmark CEO. And also last month, BlackRock partnered with Coinbase to make Bitcoin directly available to its institutional clients, which we covered in um, our second Q&A a couple of weeks ago. Shortly after, BlackRock launched a spot Bitcoin private, tr private trust for US-based in institutional investor, which hopefully in the future can be turned into a spot Bitcoin ETF that uh, the space is, is uh, greatly uh, wanting. CF Benchmark CEO Sui Chang told Coindesk, the, to the launch of BlackRock Bitcoin Fund is a sign of how far crypto has matured as an asset class. That's right. This news regarding BlackRock venturing into crypto space is not new, right? It's not the first one. 
this is just showcasing that the institutional demand is just increasing since 2021. As evidenced by Sui Chung, who is the, uh, the CF uh, CEO, CF Benchmark CEO, um, he said that the institutions reaching out to CF Benchmarks shows that they're understanding the fundamentals of Bitcoin and the fundamentals of Ethereum, and they understand the difference between the two and not putting them in the same basket as other cryptos, right? It's evidenced by BlackRock making the right partnerships and agreements to provide crypto services to its institutional clients. Lastly, since 2021, we've seen a multitude of products and services catered towards answering institutions and business needs. We've researched some of those firms that enable institutions to enter the crypto space in our upcoming institutional asset of choice and barrier to entry report, which will be published later this month in the end of September. So keep an eye out for that report. That next, let's move on to the last segment of our 3 to 1, which is the DeFi hack analyzed by the CoinChange research team. And today we are looking at the compound ETH market that was frozen and the governance time lock, whether it's a hindrance or necessary. So let's take a deeper dive into what happened. Last week, Compound, the lending borrowing protocol, voted on-chain for implementation of a new Oracle price feed for its market. So they're moving from Uniswap v2 oracles to Uniswap v3 oracle. The issue arose when the change was implemented as it resulted in essentially the ETH market being frozen. So no more borrowing could occur since all borrow attempts would revert. The code had been previously audited by three audit firms like Didob, ABDK, and OpenZeppelin before the voting took place. Once the issue was flagged, the decision was reverted to the previous Oracle price feed contract that is still operational. This is where the controversy or issue arises. See, there's two paths now that are currently used to deal with such urgent issues in the space. First one is a more centralized approach. So the protocol's team could quickly revert to the previous working contract if they have full control over the protocol smart contracts via the admin key. Right? So that's the more centralized version. The second way of doing it is through a decentralized governance process, which involves a multi-sig and a time lock, which is what Compound uses. But the issue is the full process takes at least seven days to implement the changes in case of Compound for, uh, specifically. And it can take less or more depending on the governance process for that particular other protocols. Right. So in Compound's case, the voting has already started and the Oracle reverting to the previous version happened on September 6th. So far, no funds were stolen and lo or lost in this process, but the issue was the ETH market was frozen. It wasn't available for a period of seven days, right? Yeah, and so those issues, uh, we can say, are quite common in the space. Again, audit are a mere snapshot of the smart contract reviewed at one point in time. If the change hap if there is change that happens after the audit, then they can essentially become void of relevance. Also, the governance process for urgent matter like this one or others, like pausing market due to extreme volatility for a token, are something that could benefit from a dedicated multisig, which could enact changes faster. Coin change analyzes the governance process and control over the protocol smart contract in its risk assessment framework. And as per our analysis, it is evident that ownership of the smart contracts and they're indirectly via the, of the protocol via an admin key only, rather than a multi-sig plus an adequate time lock duration are most probable to attacks leading to users' loss of funds. Well, thank you. This concludes our 321 Q&A session this week. Uh, we'll see you in the next one in two weeks from now. Meanwhile, kick back and earn passive income using CoinChange. Take care, everyone. Take care, everyone.